Okay, so now we're getting into this whole question of high-low. You've seen that the essential structure that God designed in justifying creation is that to make it worth his while to see that creation, he basically committed himself to pouring himself into everything, to baptizing everything with a God level meaning. And when it comes to creatures with souls, because they have volition, it's a question of how much that creature wants to get the God meaning for himself. That's the key. Satan doesn't want the God meaning for him. Satan wants to create his own meaning. The people who never believe in Christ do not want a relationship with God either. They want their meaning instead of God's meaning. Similarly, all of us Christians, whether we know it or not, are at every moment deciding how much of God's meaning is getting poured into us in anything that we do. Notice most importantly that it becomes spiritual even though the thing itself is never spiritual. Only if you're between sins. Because at the time that you're between sins, that's the theme of 1 John, then the Holy Spirit is siring you. It's a mistranslation in the English where it says anyone born of God cannot sin. It's anyone being sired by God does not practice sin. Now, the NASB gets the does not practice part of that verse right. But all of them forget to translate it as a progressive in English. You are sired by your mentor. Mentor was the name of the teacher of Telemachus, who is, I think, the son of Agamemnon of Greece. So the Holy Spirit is called a mentor in John 14, which is the chapter about how the Holy Spirit does his thing. He does his thing by recalling what you've learned of Bible to your mind so that you can apply it to your life. John 14, 26. That whole chapter is about how you grow into the mansion that God has designed for you. My father's house, that's a double meaning in Greek. It means the house that's of the, the royal house, meaning bloodline. We hear a spiritual bloodline of Christ. We're all sons of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, but it also means the kind of kidding out that is occurring to you. And the, the English word kidding out, which is really British English, is katantano. I think it's katantano. I might be saying katantao. Carantano. Um, it's called equipping, usually translated as equipping in Ephesians 4.12. I think it's Ephesians 4.12. Alright. It's, I, yeah, I think they translate it with equipping of the saints or, you know, that the, the word equip, it really means to kit out. It's like, it's, it's used of a soldier who gets everything he needs so he can properly fight in the battlefield. And he's properly trained. All right, so all of that is being done by the Holy Spirit, and your mansion, your future dwelling place in heaven, your rank, your your place in society, for eternity, is determined by how well you learn and live on Bible down here. Well, you can't learn and live on Bible on your own. Holy Spirit has to do it to you. That's what John fourteen is about. That's what 1 Corinthians 3 is about when it differentiates between gold, silver, or precious stones, which only God can make. That you can't, there's no man-made version of those things. Any man-made versions are imitations. But the real thing can only be made by God. Versus woods, hay, and stubble, which are all man-made. Okay, man makes wood out of a God-made tree. Man makes hay out of a God-made, you know, growing of whatever hay is before it's broken up. And then stubble, of course, is the chopping. That's all man's works. That's what it'll end up being. Burnt. That's what 1 Corinthians 3 is about. 
So do you do the doing or does God do the doing? Okay, but the truth is that you always have to be doing something. So how can God be doing the doing when you always have to be doing something? Answer, use 1 John 1, 9 and be sired by the Holy Spirit between sins. Anything you're doing is a God deed. Whether you're going to the bathroom, doing the dishes, or doing something that you consider a good deed. Sorry, that was my alarm going off. I didn't manage to go to sleep tonight. All right? So, the high of God being baptized onto the low of what you have to be doing, and you're always doing something 24-7, that's called living. How do you get that to be spiritual? Use 1 John 1, 9, and between sins you're in a spiritual state, and because it's the Spirit operating on you, that's what makes it spiritual. Nothing you do is spiritual. Nothing. The human spirit is not, you can't even detect it. You don't know how it runs. It's a CPU. You don't know how to operate it. You have it, but you're not the computer operator. Your human spirit is a spiritual connection to God. You didn't create it. It was created for you, Titus 3, five. And only the Holy Spirit knows how to run it. That's what's called spiritual. Spiritual. Uwal makes an adjective out of spirit. Meaning from the spirit, of the spirit, by the spirit, through the spirit, in the spirit. There's nothing about you or me that's ever, ever, ever spiritual. In order to qualify as spiritual, the spirit's got to do it. And he's only going to do it between sins. He lives in you, he indwells you, but that's not the same thing as filling. Filling you means to fill you with perspicacity, fill you with the ability to do it in the Old Testament. That filling was, to some extent, you know, conceptual, you know, in the soul. Well, it's really starting there. But he also filled people with physical abilities. He still does that. He fills absolutely everybody with the ability to learn the Bible in Greek and Hebrew. Your stupidity or your intelligence, your human IQ has nothing whatsoever to do with the spiritual life. I know a retarded person who learned Greek and Hebrew. There were two of them in our congregation. Okay? You can be brain damaged and still learn it. Human, human limitations or human intelligence do not make for the spiritual life. They're not a hindrance to it, and they don't help it either. You know, people are always, all, this is one of the most sickening things I've ever heard. People are always telling me how smart I am. Well, so, that and 25 cents will buy me what? Okay? There are a lot of people more smart than me, and they don't understand Bible. And I don't understand Bible based on my smarts. I only understand Bible because I'm using 1 John 1 9. And the Holy Spirit's making me able to learn it. Nobody understands the Bible. I don't care how smart they are. Apart from the Spirit. It's not possible. And that accounts for why 99.9% .9 of Christians misrepresent the Bible. Because they're not using 1 John 1 9. They're in a carnal state, usually full of self-righteousness. And they hallucinate meaning out of Scripture that's not there. And you can't tell them anything else. Because they're so big on themselves. They think if they learn some Greek words that they know Bible. Or if they memorize a Bible verse, they pat themselves on the back. They wouldn't know the Bible if it bit them. And that's the sad state of 99.9% .9 of Christianity. The church fathers wouldn't know the Bible if it bit them. Not any of them. I'd like to think that by the end of his life, Augustine started to know. Sometimes when you hear him write in the city of God, it sounds like the light bulb was beginning to go on. <coughs> Sometimes with what Jerome says, too. And at moments in Calvin's Institutes, when he was in his 20s, but by the time he was 50, he was a total retard. You're not spiritually mature when you're demanding that while you're on your deathbed, you be taken into a meeting 
you, you know, on your deathbed, you've been on your deathbed for a month. This is what happened to Calvin. He was on his deathbed for about a month. And they were going to have a meeting in Geneva, and he demanded that they take him while he's on his bed into the meeting. In those days, beds were heavy. And then he lectures them about how he gave them pure doctrine. He gave them. That man died a spiritual retard. He might have had his high moments earlier in life, but he died a spiritual retard. Nobody talks like that as spiritually mature. Okay? So, by and large, our so-called famous Christians and most Christian teachers and students have been retards. Why? Because they don't use 1 John 1 9. They aren't learning and living on Bible, therefore under the Spirit. And what they're learning, what they think they're learning of Bible is a lot of hot air. Because they're trying to do it in their own power. And you, the, the big sign of that is when people are sitting there and it's like you can turn on almost any Christian video on YouTube and they're always telling you, you have to repent of your sins. You have to be moral. You have to do good deeds. And that's why all their arguments are so childish. That's why they're still stuck on, stuck on salvation. They don't even know what it is. They wouldn't know God if he bit them. Because they're carnal. So, the opposite occurs, however, when it's a God deed. See, they're all busy doing good deeds. They make their videos, blah de blah de blah de blah de blah de blah They make their arguments. You know, the carnal ones, you know, are big on apologetics and fancy words and theological distinctions and fancy garments and rituals. And, and and photographic sessions where they show how they're, you know, helping the world. They they always use the world, 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 world. Oh, save the world, the world, the world this, the world that, yeah. They're giving in to the third temptation in Matthew 4. When you hear anybody stress the world, what they're doing for the world, they're carnal, turn them off. Because they're into good deeds. God deeds happen no matter what you're doing, even if you're going to the bathroom, if you're between sins. Because God's doing something to you. You are the work, not what you do. You are God's work in you, not what you do. That's the theme of John 14. It's a hard lesson to learn. Just repeat it to yourself over and over. Christ hung on the cross. He didn't do anything on his own power. Not a thing. It was done to him. The cross was something that was done to him. Isaiah 53 couldn't be plainer. He was stabbed with our sins. He was stabbed. It doesn't say he did any good deeds. It's talking about something that happened to him. And then what does it say? He didn't open his mouth. He let it happen. He let himself be led away. That's Isaiah 53, 8. Like a sheep before its shearers is dumb. That's Isaiah 53, 6. And 7. It was all passive. I mean, to let somebody do something to you. You know, I, maybe it's easier for, for a woman to identify with that, although this woman never has. I know a lot of women like things being done to them. I can't stand it. A lot of women like people to primp over them and do stuff to their hair and their nails and, you know, clothing and all that. The actors have to sit in a chair and have stuff done to them. I bet they hate that. I, I hate that. I hate just sitting there and having somebody do something to me. Okay? And I know there are people who like it, but generally speaking, most people don't like to sit still and have something happen to them, more, whether it's good or bad. It, it's nerve-wracking. So it's not like, you know, there's no discomfort in having God do all the work to you. But you have to appreciate the fact that, you know what, the real job is being done by Him. 
Okay, so what do you do? You say yes. How do you say yes? Well, one John one nine is a way of saying yes. I want to be back online with God I sinned. And then God's working on you again. And you're constantly listening. And you can say, okay, well that's effort and that's the key to this audio. It's not like there's no effort on your part. But all the effort you expend isn't actually accomplishing anything. When he, when you first believed in Christ, the stories vary with people. Some people it was a really easy thing to do. Some people it was like, ah, it was the hardest thing I ever did. So there was a certain amount of effort involved to get to the place where you could actually just believe. Okay, but just because there was effort doesn't mean that your effort accomplished anything. You did expend effort, but it didn't accomplish anything. God acted on your effort as an index of your willingness, your yes. And he made good on it. That's the key. When you're expending effort on something, you are expressing a willingness to get something, to go through some trouble to get something. Effort is an index of your willingness to get whatever you're expending the effort for. If I get up and go to the store to get peanut butter, I'm willing to expend that effort because I want the peanut butter that much. See the point? Effort is an index of positive volition to something. If I'm positive to getting gas in my car, I will get up and go to the gas station and get it in my car. If I'm not positive to that, whether I need it or not, I won't. So the more effort you are willing to expend indicates a higher degree of positive attitude toward the thing that you're willing to expend the effort on. Whatever your reasons, whether they're right or wrong, it's just a flat indication of your willingness. The guys who go to Iraq voluntarily are willing to do that. Okay? Whatever their reasons are, they're willing. And that matters, doesn't it? You see? It's not about inferior or superior. Or you see another shade of the, the answer to Satan on that. Okay, Satan says, yeah, God, you're willing, to, you're willing to expend your effort to have the burden of creation on of us. But what about the burden on us of having you as God? And God's essentially saying, I know it's a burden. It matters to me that you're willing. That's why that's the only criterion. It's not about your good deeds and it's not about how good you are or how bad you are. It's about whether you're willing. See that? A person who is willing to believe in Christ believes in Christ. A person who's not willing doesn't. That's not a work. It doesn't accomplish anything. There's no merit in it. But you can't say there's no effort. And God appreciates that. It's not a credit. It's not a good deed. But it is an attitude. Don't you appreciate it when somebody is willing? Doesn't it matter more? And of course it matters even more if you know why they're willing. You know, a lot of women will marry a guy because he's rich. Well, they're willing to marry him because he's rich. They want the money. Not necessarily the guy. And unfortunately, you know, the poor guy gets saddled with knowing that at some point. But what if the woman marries him because of him despite his money? That happens too. Because money's a burden. It really is. You marry a rich guy, you're stuck with all the burden that goes with that. So you better love the guy. I mean, like, for example, when uh, Kate Middleton married... Uh, Prince William, you know she loved him. First of all, she spent 10 years training. 
She had to love him. No, but how, she, you can't, how can you marry? How can you marry somebody who's going to be a king if you don't love him? It's too much of a burden. You better love him more than than the hassle of, of the life that you're going to live. I can't think of a worse life than that. I cannot think of a worse life than having to be king over a country. I mean, that's a constitutional monarchy, but in many ways that makes it tougher. It's harder to be a constitutional monarch than to be, you know, an absolute monarch. In some ways, being an absolute monarch is harder. And all of us are going to be absolute monarchs, or we're actually all in training to be absolute monarchs. Over our smaller kingdoms, whatever they end up being. Everybody, every one of us is going to be in charge of something. That's what we're in training for. Because you can't learn God from God's viewpoint if you don't learn how to be in charge of something. Even if it's only yourself. Which of course you are. You're responsible for your own decisions. But you see how all of this is high being baptized to low? You can do anything between sins and the Holy Spirit's working on you. It becomes a God deed. The thing of itself is never spiritual. You of yourself are never spiritual. What he does to you is spiritual. Okay? So, the bottom line is, not only ennobled, not only you get the, 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 the bidirectional relationship, not only is a thing that was totally unworthy and sterile, made to bear kids. That's Isaiah 54, 1. But it's perfect. It's perfected and it's perfect. Because God is joining himself to everything and when you're willing, you're going through some effort, it's hard to understand this stuff. It takes a lifetime to even get to the bidirectional That's part of the relationship too and it's perfect for you and for him because now this low thing that you're living that would otherwise be intolerable has this huge over-the-top benefit of being able to instead have, be an occasion to learn Christ better because we all wish we were home and seeing him, right? Well, that's what this produces. Seeing him better. Seen through his eyes. And at the same time, from God's level, he's inserting himself into your life. He's already baptized whatever you are and whatever you're doing with a meaning. But how much of it are you getting? Only as much as you're willing to get. That's why you keep on using one John one night. That's essentially a vote to be in fellowship so God can do to you. And you don't even know what he's doing to you. You just know he is. Because that's the promise of Bible, specifically in 1 John. You know, and, and Ephesians 3, 15 through 19 that he just called to my mind that leads to the Ephesians 4, 13 goal, which is the mature maturation of Christ. God is doing to you the same thing he did to Christ. He grew Christ the same way as he's growing you. That's the legacy of the cross. That's why church is different from the Old Testament. The Old Testament people didn't have this option. Because there was no Christ yet. And that is... Where is that? That's in the Gospel of John. I want to say John 7.39. That's what's springing to my mind. Because the, because the fullness... The, the, because the Holy Spirit hadn't come on him yet. I, I'm not sure I'm giving you the right verse and the computer's off. Um, yeah, it's it's the one where it says the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet. It'll be in the video description. I'll put the verse in the video description. I want to say it's 7.39. 7.39, 7 I'm not sure I can hear him rightly. I'm very tired. 7.38? I want to say it's John 7.38, 7.39, somewhere in that vicinity. The Holy Spirit had to indwell the soul first. 
and fully develop the soul first before the soul could be cloned into other souls. As my pastor liked to explain it, Christ is the prototype. Of course, that's Hebrews 12 too. We become the righteousness of God in him. All right. So the Old Testament people didn't get to go this far in intimacy with God that we get. That's why it's perfect now. now. I have a really hard time living this out as everything I've ever said in the videos and audios and web pages. Saying it is one thing. Living it out is a whole other ball game. But this is, this is the actual story. It's perfect because it's joined. The high is joined to the low. That's the essence of the cross. High God joined to low sense. High God man joined to low sense. That's what perfected it. That's why Hebrews 10, which just flew into my mind, Hebrews 10, 10 through 14 reads as it does. That's why he perfected, brought to completion, that's teleo again, for all time sanctified for all time the joining of the high to the low which means that every moment in time is perfect because that moment in time existed in other words before it happened and after it happened because it would happen good truth bad truth any truth because truth because that truth was going to happen then all the truth and all the time before that time and all the truth and all the time after that time is perfect too by the same joining mechanism of high to low. This has so many applications it's not even funny. Okay? If, you know, you're a normal human being or at least somewhat normal, so am I, and in any given day we have X number of events that go wrong. Okay, if we take the narrow human viewpoint of them, we're going to get ticked off or feel bad in one way or another. And then we're going to seek some kind of compensation for the bad thing. Okay, but what, if we remember this, it's already perfect. God has already baptized that bad thing with the God meaning. So then you can look to God and say, okay, I want your God meaning out of this. Because you got to vote for it or you don't get it. Just like you have to vote to be saved or you're not saved. When you believe in Christ, you're voting for his payment. Okay, you can vote to pay it yourself or you can vote for his payment. God voted for his payment, not yours. So when you believe in Christ, you're believing in his payment, not yours. The same thing is true after salvation. This bad thing happened. Do you want to address it yourself? Redress it yourself? Or do you want God to redress it for you? If yes, you want God to redress it for you, what's his answer? Well, see, now all of the Bible that you've been learning comes to bear. You have this whole whatever you know about Bible. Okay, how does the what are the Bible principles that come to bear so you can discern what God's meaning is on this bad thing that happened to you? Notice how you're going about the answer in a very different way from sin or good deeds. You're not proud of yourself for you know sustaining the sacrifice of this bad thing that happened to you. That's the good deeds argument, which obviously is sinful and immoral, because you're you know priding yourself on suffering. Excuse me. And you're not getting angry, and you're not seeking revenge, and you're not getting fearful, and you're not feeling guilty. What are you doing instead? Your brain is instead saying, okay, Dad, what Bible applies to this bad thing that happened to me just now? What's the God meaning of this? I want to learn from this. And you're going to be surprised often about what God's answer is. Okay, and I started this whole series with a sprained arm. And I initially did the sinful thing, you know, feeling sorry for myself, you know, being angry, you know, feeling guilty, you know, all the things that humans do. 
it didn't last very long because I've been doing this, you know, Bible thing for so long, it kicks in sooner. But, you know, everybody has his breaking point. Okay, so this bad thing that happens to you has a God meaning for it. God allowed it for a reason. And he's got a blessing he wants to give you through it, with it, from it, just like the Egg McMuffin. Okay, so what is it? And if you're busy, if you get into the habit of associating the thing that you're doing with some God meeting, and you do it over and over like practicing piano, okay? Associative thinking is, is basically how learning occurs. That's, it. That's how you become skilled at something. You become skilled at the copier because you do it over and over and over again. You become skilled at piano because you do it over and over again. You become skilled as a surgeon or as a race car driver or as a, 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 a diapering. Everything requires repetition to do it well. The more often you do it, the more automatic it becomes, the better your skill becomes. Well, this is the skill. Here's this thing that happens to me. It's good, it's bad, it feels good, it feels bad. It's mundane, it's stupid, it's nice, it's too nice. What do I do with this? What's the God meaning? You keep asking that question, it will become a habit to ask the question, and it will become a, so ingrained that when the bad stuff happens that distracts you from the question, the question will come up sooner. And you're going to be really surprised at God's answers. I'm totally surprised that this sprained arm thing has generated these audios. I've known this material for at least 15 years really well. And yet it, was, it didn't crystallize as much as it's doing now. All because I sprained my arm and I have to lay back and, you know, let the, I can't type. I have to let the arm heal and let it sit alone. And so I got to do something. So I talk into this tape recorder. Whether anybody listens or not is kind of beside the point. God, God knows who's supposed to be the audience. I don't pay attention to that. But you see the point? He took a bad thing and he's doing this with it. And I'm learning a ton from it. I hope others will also, but that's God's doing. It's a God deed. I've been listening to the audio after I did it, and I'm like, wow, that's good. I usually hate hate my audios and my videos and my web pages. This stuff is turning out to be really good. It's more conversational. It's more along the lines of what everybody knows. It's not as geeky as most of my stuff has to be. Because I do have to do the geeky videos. I have to do that Hebrew meter. Nobody in the world knows that but me. So I have to get it out there. But this is the other end of it. This is very conversational. It's very basic. Easy to understand. Works with stuff everybody knows. And I had to sprain my arm before it would happen. Well, because I'm that much of a jerk. Or this is God's timing. I don't know which. But this is a perfect example of how he does things in your life too on everything every second each of our lives God has a God meaning baptized onto it and if we're asking God for the God meaning notice what we're not doing we're not sinning we're not engaging in good deeds and we're learning and living on Bible because when you ask God what's the God meaning the answer is always going to involve Bible principles, Bible verses, Bible ideas, and he's going to knit them into your head. He's going to connect the dots for you. And for a lot of you, because I mean, I can't be unique in this, he's going to call Bible verses to your mind in whatever language you learn them. He's going to call Bible addresses to your mind. He's going to stitch together keywords from various verses all over the Bible in certain cases, and bring them all to your mind at once. And you'll actually understand that. That's if you're between sins and you keep doing this as a habit. It becomes a skill. My pastor called that doctrinal instincts and doctrinal skills. Because it's the repetition. But the repetition doesn't happen if you don't say, okay, I want the God meaning. 
I'm using one gel and nine. Okay, I'm between sin. What's the God meaning of this email I gotta write or the dishes I gotta do? Well, how how does the Bible come to bear on this? What should I be thinking, Dad? And it sounds very legalistic, but it isn't. You're doing it because you want something more out of the moment than the thing you gotta do. You know? I mean, you could turn on the television and you could also be thinking, okay, what's God meaning out of the news that I'm hearing? You see how it's always bi-directional? You're always doing the vertical. You get into this habit of associating vertical and horizontal. Okay, now you know what that is, don't you? Vertical is what? I. Horizontal is what? L. I for integrity, L for love. Integrity, love is being built in you. Because true love is an integrity. It holds together no matter what goes wrong or what goes right. Love based on attraction can't hold together. It has to be based on integrity or it's no good for nothing. Love has to be able to weather full spectrum. And who wants a love that, that's just fair weather? Nobody. But love can, attraction love can't survive when the attraction goes. Real love is not like attraction. Attraction feels like love. But real love is, is got attraction in it, but it's much more than that. It's a, it's a structural integrity that holds. Okay? And if you're constantly thinking toward God, what should I be thinking? What should I be doing? And you're using everything in your life as an occasion for dialogue with God, then everything gets associated with Him. And therefore, the next time a temptation hits, you kind of don't notice it as much. Because you're too busy trying to think about what Bible applies. So then you're not sinning as much. So then you're on line with God more. So now you're happier. And you're also not doing so many good deeds. Because you're more concerned about, well, gee, I, I, I don't know if this is a good deed or a God deed. Well, then maybe don't do the good deed. Maybe wait till you know. Because th there's nothing that compares with the satisfaction of knowing that it's a God deed. And it can't be better than that. Okay? That's th the big thing that I've been learning, too, with this audio. Is that I hear it and it's like, this is a much better quality of um, output than I, I feel that I've actually done in other things. And that's because I'm helpless, I'm just talking. You know? And I don't know what I'm going to say next. Most of the time in my videos, I don't know what I'm going to say next, so... Most of the time it's God deed quality, but, you know, sometimes I, there's too much of me mixed in it. So that's the, the idea, is that every single second is joined. That makes it perfect. God perfects it at his end by pouring himself into it, at your end by you getting him into it. Then whatever's wrong with you doesn't matter. And he doesn't care that you're less. You're an excuse for him to show his love to you. Whatever's wrong or right about you, whatever it is, you exist. That's why he wants you, so he can show his love to you by pouring himself into you. That's Ephesians 1, 15 through 23 that just came to mind. Filling all in all. So it's perfect. Even when it feels bad, even when it is bad. Because he's putting himself into it, he's baptized the meaning onto it. And it's only a question of how aware you are that that's the real nature of every moment you breathe. And it's only a question of how much you want him to do it to you. In other words, it's just like salvation. You hear the gospel all the time. All right, so that's the God meaning. It's going out to everybody. Okay, but how much of that gospel salvation do you get? 
Well, if you believe, you get it all. If you don't believe, you don't get any. And the money stays, as my pastor likes to call it, in escrow. In other words, he depicted salvation as an escrow payment. Christ paid for the whole, everybody. And it sits up there in escrow just waiting for people to say yes. And if they don't say yes, well, then they don't get saved. But it was paid for and it's sitting on deposit. And he also likened the post-salvation life to escrow. He calls it escrow conveyance when you reach maturity, the Ephesians 4.13 standard. Then your escrow is conveyed to you. All right, at a certain maturation level. And then, you know, this benefit of the spiritual life being mature, there are a lot of special blessings specifically with respect to knowing scripture that you get. And there are all kinds of other benefits too. And they're all for more training. But in order to get there, you have to say yes. It's And that's uh, Hebrews 9. The will and testament was executed by Christ. But the beneficiaries of that will can elect against the will of Christ. Okay? So yeah, the first time you say yes to the gospel, you're saved. Okay, that's one of the clauses in the will is salvation to heaven. But there are many more clauses in the will about changing your thinking, maturing in Christ. And the beneficiary can elect against the will. So do you elect the will or not? Do you elect against learning and living on Bible or not? To the extent you're doing good deeds, to the extent you're involved doing rituals, to the extent you're hung up on your denomination. Because those are all examples of childish things where people are trying to do it in their own power and slapping God's name on it. They don't mean to do that, but that's what's happening. To the extent you're doing those things, you're not getting God deeds. You're getting good deeds and a whole lot of approbation by humans who will call you spiritual, but you won't be. But if you're using 1 John 1 9, and you're learning and living on Bible under whoever is your right pastor in any denomination, then between sins, God's doing something to you even if you don't know. And that's God deeds. And then, eventually... You build up, and you build up, and you build up in understanding. And then you become gold, silver, and precious stones, First Corinthians 3. You become mature to the level of Christ, Ephesians 4.13. So it's perfect at all points. And the thing that you're doing at all points is of itself not spiritual. But if you're voting yes by using 1 John 1 9, learning and living on, on Bible under your pastor, then God's doing it to you and it's perfect and you're getting those deposits conveyed to you every moment you vote. And then it's God deeds and Satan's being defeated every moment because you're making the choice he won't make. And you don't even lift a finger. It's because of what God does to you that makes it perfect. You know that. But it's a moment by moment thing. God baptizing into you when you say yes. Even pee. Think about it. 